Why not? All right. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Charlie Froman, who's going to give us the second half of his uh, mini course on quantum hyperbolic geometry. All right. And so the idea today is to be concrete. All right. And what I want to talk about first is what the representations up to trace equivalents of uh, z cross z into SL2C look like. And then we're, we're modding out. We, we can't tell the difference between two representations if, if the traces are the same for every element of the group. So what we're going to do is we're corresponding to the generator 1, 0, we're going to choose a matrix and corresponding to the generator uh, 0, 1, we're going to choose a matrix that lives in, you know, this pair lives in SL2C cross SL2C, but, but they have to commute. And so if, you know, L is diagonable, then up to conjugacy, we can assume that it's of the, this form, because if you have two matrices to, that commute, they're simultaneous, and one of them's diagonal than the other one is, and they're simultaneously diagonal. So most of the time, it looks like this. Sometimes you have these two bad conjugacy classes, and it doesn't make any difference what lambda I write down here, as long as it's non-zero. It's the same conjugacy class. Uh, but in the closure of these conjugacy classes is this pair of conjugacy classes. And so if you're measuring things with a continuous function, you can't tell the difference between these and those, which means that as far as trace equivalence goes, this answer is universal. So we have a map C that goes from the complex plane cross the complex plane minus the origin, because we have to invert, to uh, trace equivalence classes of representations that takes the pair of non-zero complex numbers to the trace equivalence class of those matrices. Now, that map isn't one-to-one. -one. And the reason why it isn't one-to-one is that if I conjugate one of these matrices by this guy, it exchanges the diagonal entries. And so C is a twofold branched cover. And uh, the branch points are the central representations. Branch points are the central representations. But you know, a twofold cover is always normal, and so there's a deck transformation. And the deck transformation uh, takes uh, L and M to L inverse, M inverse, because you can't, they're a conjugate representation. Okay? And, and so sometimes this is called the pillow case. But now, this, this is actually an algebraic mapping. And so pulling back by C defines a map from the coordinate ring of the character variety of the torus into the coordinate ring of the uh, Cartesian product of the complex numbers minus 0 with the complex numbers minus 0, which is just Laurent polynomials in L and M. And now remember, this is the Kaufman bracket skein algebra of, of the torus at Q equal to negative 1. And so what we really have is an embedding of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra into Laurent polynomials, 
and I'm going to diverge from my notes. So, so the curve on here, which is like the longitude, you, sell it, you send it to L plus L inverse, because what you're doing is you're sending, remember the curve is essentially the trace, so you're sending the curve to the trace, and you send the meridian to uh, M plus M inverse. And actually, to know everything, you figure out where the curve, which is the longitude times the meridian goes, and that's LM plus L inverse, M inverse. And that determines this mapping. And it's image, so the, the image of C star are, those, are the symmetric Laurent polynomials, the ones that are fixed by the deck transformation. Okay. So that led me to believe that you could embed the Kaufman bracket gain algebra in a non-commutative torus. And you see the thing, so, so there's a, a canonical way to quantize Laurent polynomials in two variables, and that's the Weyl algebra. So what we're going to do is we're going to define this quotient of, of Laurent polynomials in non-commuting variables, and the commutation relation is just that. And this is a really um, simple algebra to compute with because it's essentially polynomials in two variables, and you have this like extra little thing running around in there when you commute things past, but it has the same basis. It's easy to work with. And uh, there's a really excellent basis for this. And what you do is you take Q to the negative IJ, and then you take L to the I, M to the J. And these, where I and J span over Z cross Z, they span that algebra. And now, multiplication in terms of these uh, guys is really easy because it's Q to the determinant of IJ KL times EI plus K J plus L. And now SL2Z, which happens to be the mapping class group of the torus, acts on this algebra. And in this basis, the action is obvious. So if I have uh, A, B, C, D in here, and I want to let it act on I, J, what I get is E, A, I plus B, J, C, I plus D, J. And so all you're doing is you're treating this as a column vector of integers. And now, because this matrix has determinant 1, it, perturb, it preserves those determinants. And so SL2Z acts as automorphisms of this algebra. And this is there are lots of, you know, like Don Zagier loves finding actions of SL2Z on algebras, right? All right. So now we got to talk about the Kaufman bracket skein algebra. Boy, am I going too fast? Am I racing? It's okay. I'm making sense. Good. Because I feel like I'm racing. Okay. So now I want to talk about the Kaufman bracket skein algebra of the torus. Now, remember last time we saw that a basis is given by multi-curves. So a multi-curve on a torus is really easy because once you have one non-separating simple closed curve on a torus, it cuts it open into an annulus. And any other non-trivial you know, non simple closed curve you put on there has to be parallel to it. And so a typical multi-curve 
boy, might be that guy. Or maybe I can have a two parallel copies. And they're not oriented. And so they're indexed by pairs plus or minus p plus or minus q in z cross z because we don't care which way the path goes. If the GCD of p and q is 1, it's just a simple closed curve. And so then it's a, a simple closed curve. And if the GCD of p and q is d, then it's d copies of the simple closed curve p over d, q over d. So that's, that's a basis for this algebra. And now I want to just, just for a, just let's pause for a second. And suppose we wanted to multiply three copies of the longitude times three copies of the meridian. Well, that means there are nine crossings, which means that if you were going to resolve those crossings once, once one at a time with the, you know, the Kaufman bracket skein relation, you'd be looking at two to the ninth terms. Okay, and so at the time we we did this, everybody believed that all the computations in quantum topology were exponential in nature. And if you believe that, you cannot possibly believe that you could map it into the non-commutative torus where you can do computations in polynomial time. Okay, so only an idiot would try this. Okay. All right. But in fact, this particular algebra has a nice presentation. So if I took the longitude or the meridian, boy, I, I should have put it the longitude. If I took the longitude and I multiply by the meridian, well, then I only have one crossing in the product, and now I can resolve it, and I get uh, Q times uh, this guy plus Q inverse times that guy. Whoa, 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 shoot. <laughs> Hey, at least somebody's awake. I just wish it was me. Okay, there we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this guy x1, this guy x2, and this guy x3. And I don't really care about that one. That's just some other, some other curve. And, and remember, there's a way of drawing all the simple closed curves on the torus as sort of points, rational points on the circle. And so this guy here being infinity, that's the meridian. And this guy being, or did I just do it backwards? Is it meridian over longitude? Meridian over longitude. So this is the meridian, that's the longitude, and that's the 1, 1 curve. And what we have is this part of the Ferry diagram. And what that guy is, is the other part of the, the other triangle in the ferry diagram that shares vertices with those two guys. And then what you do is you're going to multiply this through by Q and get that to appear with a 1. And so you're going to take Q times x1, x2, and then you're going to multiply them in the opposite direction, which is going to change the powers of Q. And you're going to take the difference, and what you're going to get is q squared minus q to the negative 2 x3. And then you cyclically rotate it, and it turns out topologically 
that's not a problem. And so now if I do x2, x3 minus q inverse x3, x2, I get q squared minus q to the negative 2, x1. And if I do q, x3, x1 minus q inverse x1, x3, I get q squared minus q to the negative 2, x2. And now by induction, knowing that you get this other side of the triangle by multiplying like this, you can see that you can produce every simple closed curve on the torus as some sort of polynomial in x1, x2, x3. And then you can take powers to get all the multi-curves. x1, x2, and x3 generate this algebra. And then by an inductive argument, keeping track of paths inside the Ferry diagram, you can prove that this is, in fact, a presentation for the algebra. And so it's, you take the non-commutative polynomials in x1, x2, x3, and you mod out by these relations. And that's the skein algebra of the torus. So then, if you're going to define a homomorphism from the skein algebra of the torus, kq of t2 into c l l inverse m m inverse q, you just have to pick out where x1, x2, and x3 go to, and then make sure they satisfy the relations. And x1 is going to go to e1, 0 plus e negative 1, 0, which is essentially l plus l inverse. x2 is going to go to e0, 1 plus e0, negative 1. And x3 is going to go to e11 one, one plus e negative 1, negative 1. And then it's pretty easy to check that those satisfy those relations. And there is a homomorphism that goes into there, which corresponds exactly to the homomorphism I wrote down in the commutative case. So you just say multi curves give you powers? Multi curves give you powers. And now, Powers are nasty, OK? But, but it turns out now, by induction, walking around the fer ferry diagram, it's easy to show that if the greatest common divisor of, well, p and q, i and j is 1, then, in fact, the, that multi-curve, i, j, goes to e, i, j plus e negative i negative j. Now, what you'd like is to have a simple formula for all the diagrams. And the problem is, with a diagram, then you're just taking powers of this, and it gets messy. But what you can do is you can use the Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind, which, remember, if you apply them to q plus q inverse, you take the kth Chebyshev polynomial case Chebyshev polynomial, remember this, is q to the k plus q to the negative k, then, uh, then you just get the lead term. And so what we do is, given p and q, a multi-diagram, so that its greatest common divisor of, of p and q is d, we define the non-commutative cosine, and that's what that stands for, to be the result of threading p over d, q over d, with the d Chebyshev polynomial. And now the formula gets completely uniform. And we're just sending that guy to e to the pq plus e to the negative p, negative q. That's it, which is a very, very simple formula. This is in a paper in Transactions of Math. And this was joint work with my second PhD student, Razvan Jelka. Okay. But uh, what do I want to say? One more thing, I want to tell you how to multiply two of these guys together. So I take ijc times 
KL C, and the answer is Q to the determinant I J K L of I plus K J plus L C plus Q to the negative I J K L I minus K J minus K C. And if you remember the product to sum formula for the Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind, that, that's it. Oh, oh, minus L. Thanks. There it is. And now, that's, that's, that's pretty quick to compute. <laughs> OK. So all of a sudden, this thing that everybody thought was exponential in nature turned out to actually be polynomial in nature. Well, you know, I'd have to, so the nine crossing thing, first I'd have to write it out in terms of the Chebyshev polynomials, and so that'll be the, the third guy, and then you'll have to add on, uh, it's not so bad. Okay. It's, it really, it's not so bad. It's quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. Okay. So, what is the image of this map? So, there's an automorphism of the non commutative torus that takes uh, EPQ to E negative P negative Q. And if you think about it, if you change the signs of both rows in a two by two matrix, you don't change the determinant. And so this is an automorphism. And then the image of C star is, of course, C, you know, L plus or minus one, M plus or minus one, Q, the part that's fixed under theta. That was one thing I wanted to say. Another thing I wanted to say is that C star intertwines the action of the mapping class group on the torus with the uh, on the skein algebra of the torus skein algebra of the torus with the action on the non-commutative torus. So what I wrote down is exactly now the action of the mapping class group okay, on this larger algebra. Um, the image of C star is an order. Okay, an order in a ring, so B in an algebra A is an order if when I take all central combinations of elements of B, I, I get A. And now, now here I have to be careful. This is when uh, Q is a root of unity. In the, uh, in the other cases, it's not true. But when it's a root of unity, it's an order in that algebra. Okay. So that means that, but I think this is, yeah. I probably ought to, you know what, I probably should be localizing here before I say that. <laughs> after localization. Okay. So now let's, let's just start talking about roots of unity. And
So now we're going to assume that zeta is a 2nth root of unity where n is odd. Okay. Well, lying inside the non-commutative torus is the subalgebra generated by nth powers of L and M. And that is the center of the non-commutative torus. And that, that should be obvious because um, once, well, here's why. Suppose I had E, you know, Ni, Nj, and I'm going to multiply that by E, K, L. Well, what we get is we get zeta to the determinant Ni, Nj, K, L, E, N, I plus K, N, J plus L. But now the N factors out, and what that is is negative 1 to the determinant I, J, K, L, E, N, I plus K, uh, boy, N, J plus L. And now, if I multiply in the opposite direction, I'll get the opposite sign because I'm exchanging the two rows of the matrix. But if I take negative 1 and raise it to plus 1, it's the same answer as negative 1 raised to the minus 1. And so that's, that's the center. Okay, And so then... Um, Yes? On the left hand side, do you just mean the usual polynomials from Elliot? Left hand side. Oh, no. There, I mean, well, you're right. You're right, but, but these become that. When I just work with the nth powers, the zeta doesn't count anymore. Okay. Yeah, commutative, yeah. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a copy of the coordinate ring of C star cross C star, right? The the so so in fact, C L plus or minus one M plus or minus one zeta is a free module of rank n squared over its center. And in fact, it's an Azamaya algebra. And so what we know is that it has one irreducible representation for each point of the variety corresponding to its center. So then what we do is we choose an ordered pair. in there. And this, it turns out we get the same representation no matter which x we choose. But we have to choose an nth root of b in order to write down this representation. And now representations of this algebra will all be into n by n matrices because it's an n squared dimensional algebra. And so what we're going to do is we're going to send L, I'm going to write it for 5 because that's about how much patience I figure you guys have. Okay. And I'll just put this A up in the upper left hand corner. And now I'm going to send M 
to, well, what I do is I put x, I put x zeta to the negative 2, x zeta to the negative 4, all the way down to x zeta uh, to the negative, well, to the 2 minus 2n, 2 minus 2n. And that's it. And these are what is known as the cyclic representations of the vial algebra. And this is where Kashayev started out. He computed the 6j symbols for these representations. If you take the tensor product of two of these uh, representations, the, the tensor product recapitulates multiplication in C star. And the tensor product breaks down into a decomposition of n uh, identical copies of the representation that lies over the image point. And the unsymmetrized 6j symbols turn out to be the quantum dilogarithm. And so these are the guys that that lie at the beginning of all this quantum tensor theory, these representations. Now, the example I'm working is the simplest possible example. This is done before there was a quantum Teichmuller theory, okay? But what is quantum Teichmuller theory? You take the Kaufman bracket skein algebra and you map it into a non-commutative torus, and they can do it for the Kaufman bracket skein algebra of any punctured surface. And so now you have this algebra, the Kaufman bracket skein algebra, that's next to impossible to compute in, and you've mapped it into this non-commutative torus where computation is relatively easy. And now what you do is you produce representations of the Kaufman bracket skein algebra by pulling back irreducible representations of this algebra, and the irreducible representations of this algebra are easy to write out. And the, you know, the basic example, there's a paper by Bonahan and Liu where, where they just work out what the irreducible representations are of these algebras. And so this is OK. How do I know that? How do, you, how do I know that representation is irreducible? OK. So remember, what does it mean to be irreducible? Onto. Onto. So what I need to do is with those matrices, powers of those matrices, I need to write out a basis for n by n matrices. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take m to the 0 plus m to the first plus m to the second up to m to the n minus 1. And I'm going to add those all up. Ooh, 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 except I have to be careful. I'm going to take 1 over x, 1 over x squared, over 1 over x to the n minus 1. So I'm getting rid of the x's. And now what I'm doing is I'm just summing the nth roots of unity. And the nth roots of unity are all going to sum to 0, except in the upper corner. And so what you get is that matrix. OK. Then what I can do to fill out the first column is I can just take L to the i times this sum like this, and now I'm getting all the guys going down that. Say it again. I have, excuse me? Yes. It did, it, what, what mistake am I making? You're right, it should be n. Thank you. Good eye. Thanks. 
taken care of. <laughs> and now LVI times that guy just gives me a one in the ith row. And now I take this guy and multiply by LJ, and I'm moving over the columns. And then I multiply by LI, and I'm moving down the rows. And I just produced all the EIJs, except maybe in this last column, they're EIJs times A, right? Because I had to use. So they're irreducible representations. <laughs> OK. All right. I want to talk. So here's what's going to happen. So phi is an element of SL2Z. We're going to find AB in C star cross C star fixed by phi. And this is a pretty degenerate situation. So for uh, even the punctured torus, then there's going to be a lot more information here. But, but I'm going to just restrict my attention to, uh, you know, an Anisov matrix, which means that it has real eigenvalues that are equal to plus or minus one. And in that case, it's only going to fix one representation, the trivial representation. And so what turns out, see that is the trivial representation because you're sending the longitude, actually, I guess, plus or minus one. So there are four fixed guys, but I'm just going to focus on this one. You're saying the eigenvalue of where the longitude goes and the eigenvalue of where the meridian goes are one. That's the trivial representation. And then I know phi acts on k zeta of, of T2 to k zeta of T2. But when I mod out by the ideal, and remember there's a unique ideal because at this point we're working with an Azamaya algebra, there's a unique ideal in the algebra corresponding to an ideal of the center. It, of course, because phi takes the intersection of this ideal uh, with the center to itself, it takes this ideal to itself. And then we have phi inducing this map from the quotient to the quotient. But via the representations, what we're getting is an automorphism of n by n <laughs> matrices corresponding to phi. Okay. And this is, this is what Francis says is the quantum hyperbolic invariant is that automorphism from matrices to matrices. What is I? What is I? I is the kernel of the irreducible representation. I is the kernel of the, rep the irreducible representation. And so what I'm doing is I'm setting A equal to 1 and X equal to 1. Well, actually, every element of SL2Z fixes it. And so what we're getting is a projective representation of the mapping class group. That's what we're actually getting. And, and uh, there's a theorem of Helen and Francis's, which I, I'm not sure that all the hypotheses uh, match up, but in the proceedings, that more or less says this is the Witten, Reshetik, and Turayev representation of the mapping class group. That's, that's what it is. Only it was really easy to get at, OK? Because, because we get to use this almost polynomial rings to do it. And that's the, that's, that's the whole point of this quantum Teichmuller theory, is all of a sudden you're working with really simple algebras, and everything is obvious. So I want to just take a second, and because remember, 
The Skull of Nether theorem says that that automorphism comes from conjugation by a matrix. And just because you've read a proof of the Skull of Nether theorem, like on the internet, <laughs> doesn't mean you know how to compute that matrix. And, and so this is the section of my notes, the Skull of Nether theorem for mortals that I, I skipped over from, from last time. You know it's conjugation by something. Let's just see what's going on. So I'm going to take A, B, C, D, and I'm going to assume, just because I want to write out the inverse really easily, I'm going to be conjugating by this matrix. And so the inverse of this matrix is that. And now I just want to see what it does to E11, which, by the way, I've already shown you how to write out E11. So here I go, D0, negative C, 0, times A, B, C, D equals A, D, B, D, negative A, C, negative B, C. And what you notice is the first column is A times this, and the second column is B times that. Now, because this is an automorphism, one of those columns is non-zero. We'll just assume it's the first column. And now I'm going to do the same thing, just walking down the first column of the, the matrix and see what happens next. Now I get negative B, 0, A, 0, and now A, B, C, D. Wow! I get <laughs> negative A, B, negative A squared, negative B squared, negative A, B. Notice the first column of this matrix is just A times the first column, and the second column of this matrix is B times that. And so what you do is you find a column, like the jth column of theta E11 that is not 0. And the ith column of the matrix is the jth column of theta applied to EI1. And there it is. You can just compute the matrix by hand, which is what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes. So you can see it. All right. All right, well, we'll resume in 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. Outside of unity. Uh, 